This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Iranians defy Iran's supreme leader, take to the streets, call for an end to his regime. Could this lead to a revolution and an overthrow of the government? Plus, we look at the hidden revival inside Iran, transforming lives. And Israel discovers artifacts near the Western Wall, all the way back to the First Temple. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Iranians throughout their country are keeping up their protests against their leaders, calling for an end of the Islamic regime. The demonstrations have led to clashes between protesters and security forces, while both President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu have encouraged the protesters. In a rare show of defiance, some demonstrators shouted, Death to Khomeini, Iran's supreme ruler. What began as economic protests have escalated into calls for Iran's religious leaders to step down. Many of the protesters are frustrated. Youth unemployment is at nearly 30 percent, and Iran is spending billions of dollars in foreign interventions in Iraq and Syria. But Iran's President Hassan Rouhani says, anarchy won't be tolerated. The government will definitely not tolerate those groups who are after the destruction of public properties or disrupting the public order or sparking riots in the society. But President Trump tweeted encouragement to the Iranian people. He said Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. Trump's support of the demonstrators and condemnation of Iran's leaders contrasts sharply to President Obama's reaction in 2009. He remained silent when millions of Iranians took to the streets to protest a presidential election that many Iranians believe was rigged by the regime. Iran's President Rouhani claimed that Israel is behind the protest. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called that claim laughable and explained why he believes Iranians are pouring into the streets. They seek freedom. They seek justice. They seek the basic liberties that have been denied to them for decades. Iran's cruel regime wastes tens of billions of dollars spreading hate. This money could have built schools and hospitals. No wonder mothers and fathers are marching in the streets. The regime is terrified of them, of their own people. He also blamed Europe for its silence. Sadly, many European governments watch in silence as heroic young Iranians are beaten in the streets. That's just not right. And I, for one, will not stay silent. This regime tries desperately to sow hate between us, but they won't succeed. And when this regime finally falls, and one day it will, Iranians and Israelis will be great friends once again. I wish the Iranian people success in their noble quest for freedom. To learn more about the situation in Iran, CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl talked with an Iranian expert in our Jerusalem studio. Dr. Tamar Gindin, you're an expert on Iran. Welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. Glad to be here. Where did these protests come from? The people we see in the streets are, we, we see old people, retired people who lost their retirement funds. We see younger people who just want change. You know, they have social media. They see that in other places, people have freedom of speech. In Iran, there is freedom of speech. There is no freedom after speech. But they see <laughs> that in other places, they do have freedom after speech. They want a secular democracy. They don't want this dictatorship they're living in. Now there's these pro-government demonstrations. So where, how, where did that come from? They bring people. Sometimes they force people. Sometimes they, they bring whole buses from workplaces. So we can't really necessarily take that as real support for the government. Right. When there are anti-regime protests, they're usually real because these people risk their lives. When it's pro-government, they sometimes r risk their lives if they don't. So we don't know how real it is. Maybe just tell us a little bit about what's happening in the social media uh, right now in Iran. <laughs> okay, um, now because I follow bo both anti-regime and pro-regime channels, 
I know that we don't know. It yeah. depends who you read. Yeah. There's so much information, contradictory information, mm -hmm. that actually we know that banks are being burnt and broken, and blessed of being broken. We don't know who does it. We know uh, at least the protesters do it because they really want change. Right. Um, now, the government says that it's us. <laughs> yeah. Us meaning the West. Right. Um, Israel is behind it, Saudi Arabia is behind it, the US is behind it, the enemies of the Iranian nation uh -huh. uh, are behind it. And what the people say to that, okay, so you say the people is with you, we want a referendum. And what are the chances that they'll get one? I think it's not very high. <laughs> Where do you see these, these demonstrations going? I see them being suppressed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sentiment is there, both the anger and the hope. Uh, people have gone out in the streets in a lot of places and said, we don't want an Islamic Republic. Maybe the government will give them a real just referendum. I doubt. I don't know where and when, but there will be more protests. And the poor the people are, uh, the more oppressed they are economically and politically, uh, the less they have to lose. Mm -hmm. And once they have nothing to lose, uh, they will go out on the streets again. They now don't go uh, in masses because they know that the price in Iran would be higher than Syria. My hope is that some miracle will happen and the change will come from above, mm -hmm. as it did in Russia, uh, mm -hmm. from Gorbachev. The real question is, if it, if it succeeds, what happens next? Because we've seen the Arab Spring, yeah. we see Russia today, the people want something better than what they have now. They want freedom. I really hope that's what they'll have, but I don't know when and where. Turning to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Palestinians reacted angrily when President Trump threatened to cut off aid to the Palestinian Authority. The face-off puts any future negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians in doubt. In a pair of tweets, President Trump said, we pay the Palestinians hundreds of millions of dollars a year and get no appreciation or respect. They don't even want to negotiate a long overdue peace treaty with Israel. He added, with the Palestinians no longer willing to talk peace, why should we make any of these massive future payments to them? I think the president um, has basically said that he doesn't want to give any additional funding um, or st stop funding until the Palestinians are agreeing to come back to the negotiation table. We're trying to move for a peace process, but if that doesn't happen, the president's not going to continue to fund that situation. USAID accounts for 40 percent of the budget for the UN's Relief and Work Agency, better known as UNRWA. It provides millions of dollars to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and West Bank. Many Israeli officials have lobbied the U.S. to stop payment because UNRWA is influenced by Hamas. Some Palestinian officials call the threat blackmail. I would say that Palestinian rights are not for sale and we will not succumb to blackmail. There are imperatives and requirements for peace. And unilaterally, President Trump has destroyed them. The war of words between the Palestinian Authority and President Trump mark one more disagreement after Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and decided to move the U.S. Embassy there. After these latest tweets, Israeli officials had a different take from the Palestinians. President Trump is absolutely right. It is impossible to wait and wait and wait for so many years for the Palestinians to go forward and renew the negotiation. They left the room in April 14, and for four years almost, they are reluctant to negotiate with Israel, and they should not be given so much money from the American taxpayer. Some of that U.S. taxpayer money goes to a policy dubbed pay to slay, where the PA pays convicted terrorists and their families monthly salaries. The U.S. Congress is close to passing the Taylor Force Act, which would cut off Palestinian aid money unless the practice is stopped. Taylor Force was a U.S. citizen who died in Israel during a terrorist attack. A successful vote in the Senate would send the legislation to the president for his signature. Up next, a look at the apocalyptic beliefs of Iran's leaders and what it means to the world.
Many of the Iranians risking their lives in the streets say they're dissatisfied with the religion imposed on them by the ruling mullahs. Here's a story CBN's George Thomas did about the end of the world beliefs of many of Iran's leaders. Thomas filed this report several years ago when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was Iran's president. But it's still relevant to the scenes in Iran today. Amidst the chants of death to America, death to Israel, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad recently announced to massive crowds in Iran that a new Middle East is emerging. With the grace of God and thanks to the resistance of nations, the new Middle East will be realized soon without the American and the Zionist regimes. He says the chaos in the region is organized by the Imam Mahdi. The final move has begun, Ahmadinejad said. We are in the middle of a world revolution managed by this deer, reference here to the 12th Imam. A great awakening is unfolding. One can witness the hand of Imam in managing it. To trace Ahmadinejad's messianic and end-time beliefs, you have to go to a mosque in the small village of Jamkaran, tucked in a corner of Iran. Behind this mosque, there is a well. And according to Ahmadinejad and millions of Shiite Muslims, out of this well will emerge one day their version of an Islamic savior. They call him the Mahdi, or the 12th Imam. Joel Rosenberg has written a book about it. It was believed that this, this Islamic leader uh, was going to come back one day at the end of time and bring justice to the earth. Tens of thousands of Muslims visit the sacred well each night. The opening of the well is covered by a green-like metal box to prevent people from jumping in. Most of the time here is spent praying and kissing the metal box. Others scribble prayer requests to the Mahdi on pieces of paper that are then dropped into the well. Many, like this young boy with a flashlight, believe the Mahdi is actually hiding at the bottom of the well, reading those prayer requests. I was looking into the well with my flashlight, hoping to see the Mahdi, but not tonight. According to Shia scholars, the Mahdi, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, vanished in the middle of the 9th century. Shia Muslims expect the 12th Imam to return at the end of history, at the end of days, when there's a time of great genocide, warfare, chaos in the world. Sunnis, who make up the majority of Muslims in the world, have different views on the Mahdi. For instance, they believe the Mahdi is yet to be born and will descend from Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. Shia Muslims believe the 12th Imam is alive and will reappear before the Day of Judgment. Brother Wahid, a Muslim convert to Christianity, hosts a popular television show seen across the Middle East. Absolutely. All Muslims are required to believe in the end times. Despite these theological differences between Shia and Sunnis on the Islamic Messiah, belief in the last days is mandatory. Enter Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Since becoming the president of Iran back in 2005, Ahmadinejad has emerged as the Mahdi's most influential follower. In almost all his speeches, whether at home in Iran or traveling abroad, the president begs Allah to hasten the return of the Mahdi. O God, hasten the arrival of Imam Mahdi and grant him good health and victory and make us his followers. Ahmadinejad is reportedly tied to a radical Islamic society in Iran that believes man can hasten the appearance of the Mahdi. By annihilating two countries, Israel, which they call the Little Satan, and the United States, which they call the Great Satan. Shias and Sunnis believe the end days will be marked by apocalyptic times. Just before the Mahdi returns, there will be chaos throughout the world. Wars, famines, and floods will ravage the earth. But when the Mahdi comes, he will bring peace and justice. Muslims believe that when the Mahdi returns, he will be accompanied by Jesus Christ, also known in Islam as the Prophet Isa. They believe that Jesus will physically return to this world. He will kill the pigs, break the crosses, kill the Jews, and defeat the Antichrist. But until that day comes, Ahmadinejad, who sees himself as a kind of John the Baptist figure, is telling the world to prepare. He believes the end of time is near, that the Islamic Messiah is coming, 
and the way to accelerate or hasten the 12th Imam's arrival and reign on earth is to, to destroy Judeo-Christian civilization as we know it. George Thomas, CBN News. Coming up, find out about a hidden revival sweeping through Iran and transforming lives. One seldom reported phenomenon happening inside Iran is a spiritual revival. Many Muslims are becoming believers in Jesus Christ through supernatural encounters. Here's another story we did that chronicles how God is at work in areas where darkness seems to reign. As ISIS conquered parts of northern Iraq and persecuted Christian minorities, as Iran continues to suppress religious freedom, a surprising result happened. The gospel actually began to spread. So besides the darkness uh, coming, coming in and trying to get the light and salt out, killing lives and bringing so much pain and suffering, on the other hand, we're seeing the rise of the presence of God, worship, prayer, people experiencing Jesus, and people open up to the gospel and coming to know him and follow him, even from Muslim background. Fabian leads a house of prayer in Kurdistan. He told us of meeting people who had supernatural encounters with Jesus. People in these streets and in these refugee camps from places where ISIS have occupied, even people from here, that are encountering Jesus in, in, in dreams and visions. Those divine encounters are not limited to ISIS-controlled areas. It's a phenomenon happening throughout the Middle East. CBN News met with some visiting Iranians to Kurdistan who wanted to share their stories. We've concealed their identities for their own protection. One night when I was in bed, I had a dream, and the light was speaking as I'm speaking to you now. It was calling my name verbally and saying, come to me, I will save you and I will rescue you. But I didn't understand. That decision soon followed for Abby and her mother. About seven months ago, we made our own decision to follow Jesus with all our hearts. When we came here, they explained about the life of Christ and the kingdom of God according to the gospel. Here we realized that my dream was of Jesus. He is calling us to give us salvation and to give us rest, to give us life. I asked what danger she faces back in Iran. If people knew about my faith, I would be rejected. This is the type of social persecution. If the government knew about my faith, I would be executed or hung in the street at once. Claire came to faith through scripture and a friend. When I was reading the Bible, I couldn't ask others to explain the passage. When I went to university, I met an Armenian girl. I asked her so many questions. How did they live? How did they worship? Many things like that about the Christian life. Her answers brought me to make my own decision. It changed her life. Christ brought me many blessings. I can't describe how faithful Jesus has been, but things which I cannot say in words have happened to me. Whenever I am praying and I'm lifting up my spirit towards God, I do believe and I feel the hand of God touching my heart and shaking my heart. This man, we'll call Dennis, also had a dream. In the dream, I still remember some marks on his face and that he was wearing a crown, a king's crown on his head. A strong brightness came out of each part of his body and many people were bowing down before him. That dream is still alive in me and it's with me every day. I remember feeling like I saw heaven. He showed me many different things since I believed in Jesus, but that dream became a turning point in my life. I asked him if others are coming to Jesus inside Iran. Yes, many people are coming to Christ through dreams. You can't imagine how Jesus is appearing to people. I feel like everybody's looking for a home, looking for the truth. What the Iranian people are going through right now is very difficult. The only one who can change that situation is Christ himself. So please pray and ask others to pray for the people of Iran to experience the power of the resurrection. Iran's mullahs try to quench Christianity in their Islamic Republic. Despite those efforts, missionaries say Iran has one of the fastest growing churches in the world. While politics and extremists rearrange the Middle East, Fabian and others say the Holy Spirit is working at a much higher level to change lives. The harvest is very ripe and people are desperate. 
They, are, they have lost everything, they are in pain, they need help, and they are ready to listen, and people need to know that. Yes, there's many bad people, and they want to kill and destroy, but there's so much more people who are desperate for answers in life. And we as the light and salt, we need to be here for such a time as this, to be His voice and be His hand and bring the gospel of the kingdom to their lives. Israeli archaeologists reported an historic find as they excavated in the plaza near Jerusalem's western wall. They found a unique stamped piece of clay from the first temple period that was inscribed in ancient Hebrew script. The discovery confirms there was Jewish governors in Jerusalem in Bible times. We are standing now below the level of the western wall plaza between two walls of the 7th century BCE. We were here for five years, digging slowly, slowly from the level of the Western Wall Plaza to bedrock. During the restoration, everything that was in between the stones was taken out in order to put modern cement. We found a very small item, the docket. A docket is a small piece of clay that was impressed with a seal and afterwards fired. On the docket, there are two male figures standing one opposite the other. And below them, there is an inscription in ancient Hebrew script that says, Le Sar Ha'ir, belongs to Sar Ha'ir, which is the governor of the city. In the Bible, there are few governors that are mentioned by names, and also governors of Jerusalem are mentioned. Yoshea, the governor of Jerusalem in the days of King Hezekiah, and we have Maasiyao, that was the governor of Jerusalem in the days of Yoshiao. It's very important because it proves it's not only in the Bible, but there really was a governor of Jerusalem around the late First Temple period. This docket adds to the find of seven seals that we found here, carried the names of Netanyahu ben Yaush, Chagav, Yedayahu, Usha, and more and all together tells us that in this quarter where we stand right now the high administration of Jerusalem probably lived towards the end of the first temple period. This discovery is one more piece of evidence that the Bible and Jewish history have met here in Jerusalem for thousands of years. Well that's all for this edition. Thanks so much for joining us and we want to say a special hello to our viewers watching us on Alpha Omega television in Romania. Also, please remember to pray for the brave Iranians risking their lives for freedom. And remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.